Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Locker, and I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator here at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Thank you all so much for joining for this Zoom program about Zoe Anderson Norris um, in honor of our current exhibition by artist Adrian Ottenberg. Um, I'd encourage folks, um, we have a ba the banner um, right behind Eve um, for the entire program, which is lovely. I'd encourage everyone to check out the exhibition if you haven't already. Um, I'm going to be putting the link for the exhibit in the chat. So even if you're not um, local, you can at least read about the show. It's really been um, a, an absolute privilege to have it up in our space. Um, Today, Eve is going to be giving us a deep dive into the life of Zoe Anderson Norris and her connection to our Lower East Side neighborhood. And Zoe is one of the 29 historic women featured in the exhibit. And again, please, I, I really recommend you come see it before it closes on May 5th. Um, we're going to be having a Q&A at the end of this program. Um, for now, you are all muted, but you will be able to unmute yourselves at the end of the program and ask any questions that you may have. Um, in the meantime, feel free to put any questions in the chat throughout the program, and I will read them out for you at the end. For those who haven't visited us before, the museum at Eldridge Street is housed in the historic Eldridge Street Synagogue. It was built in 1887 and it was um, almost lost to ne neglect in the mid 20th century before our massive restoration project restored the space to its former glory. Um, we host public programs, walking tours, special events, um, and we really encourage you to come check us out in person if you can or um, continue to um, come to our Zoom programs. And you can always view our events calendar on our website at eldridgestreet.org slash events. Um, I just wanna feature a couple of our upcoming programs before I introduce Eve this evening. Um, on Sunday, April 14th, this coming week at 3 p.m. we have a concert, um, Sounds of Freedom with the A.L. Vilner Big Band. Um, it's a huge brass band, bigger than I think a lot of um, performances that folks have seen um, at the museum before. I'd, it's going to be a huge sound and a huge space, and I'd really encourage you to come check that out. Um, you can find that on the events calendar and register. Um, we also have a walking tour to celebrate the end of Adrian's show. Um, the walking tour is about all the remarkable Lower East Side women, and we're going to walk through the neighborhood and see where they worked, where they um, soapboxed, where they lived. Um, and that's on May 5th at 1.30 p.m. So if you're in the, if you're able to come down to the neighborhood, I'd really recommend you come check out that walking tour. And then you can also see the exhibit on its last day. And with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter tonight. Um, Eve M. Kahn is an independent scholar, a former antiques columnist at the New York Times, and she writes about art, architecture, and design for the Times, among other publications. She is the biographer of artist Mary Rogers Williams and writer Zoe Anderson Norris, who she'll talk about tonight. Um, please feel free to check out Eve on her website. I'm going to put that in the chat, evecon.com. And with that, I'm going to spotlight Eve and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here with us, Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thanks to the whole Museum at Eldridge Street team, Nancy Johnson, Sophie Lowe. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to give um, a talk to put Zoe in context of all the other amazing women that Adrian Ottenberg has immortalized in this gorgeous exhibition. So I'm going to talk for half an hour-ish about the twists and turns of fate that brought Zoe Anderson Norris from rural Kentucky to rural New York's Bohemia and to fight for the poor with her pen. This is a progress report, my uh, biography of Zoe. The manuscript is on the desk of my editor, Fred Nachbauer, thank you, at Fordham University Press, but I keep making more discoveries. So this is a progress report. I keep finding out more about her. Um, and then at the end, there's gonna be a brief architectural epilogue. I'm gonna burn through some images of uh, the places in the vicinity of the museum at Eldred Street, where Zoe worked and lived and partied. So. She was born in 1860 in Harrodsburg in, uh, in central Kentucky. By modern standards, it's about a half an hour southwest of Lexington. There's Zoe in, uh, around 1864 or so in the lower left corner as a steely determined little girl. Her parents, Henry and Henrietta Anderson. Henry lived from um, 1812 to 1872, and Henrietta lived from 1819 to 1897. Um, Zoe was the 13th of their 15 children when she was born in 1860. Some, Henry had converted as a young man to the Disciples of Christ, one of the evangelical faiths that was sweeping the American South in the early 1800s. 
Before Zoe was born, he had salaried work as a pastor and a teacher. And by the time she was born, he was focusing on translating the New Testament, again, from ancient Greek, through the lens of the disciples of Christ, making minor variations on past translations. Um, the book, he published a few editions of it. It was considered a scholarly achievement. It remains in print. Um, he, it was a considered an achievement, particularly coming from a country pastor like Henry, who had no major congregation or institution backing him. But there was a flood of cheap Bibles after the Civil War, and his edition couldn't compete. Zoe grew up at what she would later describe as the ragged edge of poverty. Um, Henry and Henrietta were both very well educated. Henry was fluent not only in ancient Greek, but also in Latin. Um, that level of erudition was only possible before the Civil War in the American South because enslaved Black people did most of the hard work around those families' homes. In my book early on, there's going to be a tribute page along these lines. I've excavated as many names as I can find of people enslaved by branches of her family in Virginia and uh, Missouri, as well as Kentucky. It's because of their labors in captivity that she grew up in a cultured milieu. She was surrounded by well-educated people. Her own nu nuclear family didn't have enough money to enslave anyone, but many, many of her relatives did. I've excavated as many names as I can find. So in a sense, her wit, her erudition, her writing career was made possible possible by these people. So my research, my writing, my, my talk here today, even in a sense, was made possible by these the labors of these people in captivity. As many names as I can find, I'm going to be including at the beginning of my book. Um, at lower left, that's the farmhouse or a farmhouse at the property at the outskirts of Harrodsburg, where she was born. A little old dog kennel town is how she described her hometown once she became a committed New Yorker around 1900. She never stopped writing about the beauties of velvety bluegrass country that she had known as a kid. Um, at top left, that's a plantation in Virginia near Fredericksburg, and her family moved to that vicinity around 1870 when her father was in failing health. He had relatives living nearby who may have been helping him with his large family. Um, in that area, Zoe would have seen fresh scars of the Civil War. There had been house-to-house -house fighting in that area. Um, during the war, she would have known that she had uh, brothers who were fighting for the federal forces and um, cousins who were fighting for the Confederacy. She would have known that her own family was as bitterly divided as the nation itself. These are a few of her 14 siblings and their spouses. I'm not gonna tell you any salient details about them. It would take up the rest of our time here this evening. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that, well, let's see, of the 14 siblings, 12 reached adulthood, 10 of them marry um, and have children. It's an enormous family. I keep still, I keep finding more descendants of those siblings around. Um, a number of them became portrait painters and photographers. It was a creative entrepreneurial family bent on documenting the world. But Zoe's the only member of the family who took up writing, who took up putting words on, on paper as a way to document the world and following in her father's footsteps and eking out a living that way. After her father's death in 1872, she was sent to an elite girls boarding school in her hometown. It's called Daughters College. The gorgeous neoclassical building that housed it survives. It's a luxury hotel. Um, it's full of memorabilia from Daughters College. And I'm giving a talk there in, um, in June, which I'm really looking forward to. Daughters College, the head of the school, John Augustus Williams, had been a good friend of Zoe's father. He probably gave her a break on her tuition in, for, her, for her to be able to afford this. John Augustus Williams sternly told the girls, do not marry until you have developed enough professional skill, perhaps as a teacher or a stenographer, that you can support your family if the male breadwinners you're counting on fail you. And Zoe didn't listen to him. She married days after graduation in 1878 at age 18, like an idiot. And I'm quoting a memoir essay she wrote just before her death in 1914. She married like an idiot, Spencer Norris. He was a storekeeper and restaurant owner. Um, he'd grown up in Harrodsburg. They would have known each other since they were kids. He was by all accounts brutally handsome and he was by Zoe's account incredibly spoiled by his mother. He was the only surviving child of a woman who'd been widowed young. Zoe and Spencer marry in 1878. They quickly have two children, a son named Rob and a daughter named Clarence. Um, by the 1880s, Spencer has moved the family to Wichita, Kansas, where the economy is booming. Um, and he runs a series of specialty grocery stores there. That's him in his delivery wagon for his grocery store on the left. 
Also in the 1880s, Zoe's widowed mother, Henrietta, and a number of Zoe's siblings go to homestead at the Kansas frontier. They would have lived in a dugout like you're seeing at top right, right? There's no building materials there until um, the railroad comes in. People are building themselves homes by digging a hole in the prairie and making an entryway for it out of blocks of, of sod or stone. Um, the land that uh, Zoe's widowed mother and siblings try to homestead on is besieged by drought, cyclones, locusts, terrible isolation, and constant wind. Um, a number of Zoe's fictional characters over the years go mad at the Kansas frontier. The wind gets into their brain and addles it. Um, her mother, Henrietta, does in fact begin to go mad at the Kansas frontier, and she's brought to an asylum in Kentucky where she dies. Zoe never stopped writing to the end of her days about being terrified that she would be committed to an asylum against her will. These photos were taken around 1898. On the left, that's Zoe's son, Rob, and of the pair of girls on the right, that's Zoe's daughter, Clarence, on the right. Um, 1898, this was around the time that Spencer um, and Zoe got a divorce on the grounds of his admitted longtime adultery. Zoe, before the divorce, had been a restless, unhappy housewife, and she'd started experimenting with fiction and journalism. She wrote, for example, a hilarious gossip column for um, a Wichita newspaper. With the divorce, that flow of words becomes a fire hose, and it doesn't end until Zoe's death. With the divorce, um, uh, Rob is not a minor anymore, and he gets to choose his own fate, and he decides to stay in Kansas. He works for various rail railway lines and ends up largely estranged from Zoe. Clarence is a minor. Zoe gets custody, and they flee Wichita. Uh, Zoe had always hated it there. She thought it was pretentious and provincial. And she needs words to support herself because uh, Spencer is legally required to pay her alimony, but um, his grocery business conveniently goes bankrupt right after the divorce, so he never pays her a dime. God not alimony, but didn't got it, is how she put it in a memoir essay just before her death. These are illustrations from some of her first stories in national publications. On the left, that's a portrait of Zoe from a short story about a Kansas cowgirl who's killed by a cyclone. She had been trying to protect her lover from the force of the storm, and a, a tree falls on her and kills her. The center portrait of Zoe is from a short story, a travelogue she wrote about visiting Colorado and being on a porch of a hotel and overhearing a man dismiss Southerners like her as inherently lazy and deciding to prove him wrong by climbing Pike's Peak, wearing nothing but thin slippers on her feet and bringing back down her torn apart silk shoes as evidence of her achievement. And on the right, that's an illustration from a short story about a woman living in Kansas who hates her mother-in-law back in the South, but is dutifully writing a letter inviting the mother-in-law to spend time with them in Kansas, dreading the experience, longing for the aid of opiates to survive it. This is apparently based on Zoe's real-life terrible relationship with Spencer's mother. 1899-1900, Zoe and Clarence travel widely in Europe, and the fire hose of fiction and journalism is often about American women traveling in Europe. So the on the, the left-hand panel, that's from a short story about an American woman writer flirting with a handsome Scotsman on a ferry crossing the English Channel. And the center panel is from a short story about an American woman visiting a hotel in Switzerland and realizing there's a Swiss woman sitting by the window hopelessly waiting for the tourists from Kentucky, the, the, the cad of a tourist who had promised to that he would come back for her someday and whisk her away from the Alps to America. And then American, and that American visiting knows that that man is never coming back, that he's married and has children back in Kentucky. Top right is a photo that Zoe took to illustrate um, her travelogue about visiting the World's Fair in Paris in 1900. On the fairgrounds, Clarence meets a handsome Brit named Harold Morris, lower right. Um, he's billed as a fabulously wealthy silk tycoon, but he's actually a deadbeat gambler, adulterer. Just as Zoe had married disastrously as a teenager, Clarence proceeds to marry disastrously as a teenager. Clarence and Harold Morris quickly have a son named Robert, and Clarence ends up stuck in London for years, trying to get out of Harold's clutches and get custody of Robert and get back to the States. By 1901, Zoe is based in New York and she basically never leaves again. She loves it here. Um, and she constantly writes about women writers in New York eking out a living. So on the left is from a short story about um, a, a woman who has deformed her thumb. She has typed so many short stories that magazines reject. 
and a suitable suitor comes to rescue that woman in the story on the left. In the story on the right, um, the woman is more successful as a writer than her boyfriend, and he calls her work trite and depressing but fashionable and storms out in a fit of jealousy. About two thirds of Zoe's many stories about love and happily, unlike her own experiences in love, um, give us something cheerful, the editors would insist, and she would try to comply. In 1902, she reaches her first peak of literary fame. She publishes a novel, The Color of His Soul. It's about a, a writer from the South named Dolly, who's living in Harlem. Zoe at that point was living on East 126th Street. She's living in Harlem and she becomes fascinated by a charismatic socialist orator living near her named Cecil Mallon. Cecil Mallon preaches sympathy for the wage slaves of the world in his firebrand speeches. And Dolly gets intrigued and she goes to try and meet some of these wage slaves and write directly about their experience. Um, she goes down to the Lower East Side and she sees the desperate conditions that immigrants are living in. And she also sees and writes about the settlement houses that are trying to help the immigrants. One of the wage slaves she meets is a teenage seamstress who's pregnant and unmarried. So she can't work and she can't find a place to live. Dolly tries to help her, but this teenager dies in childbirth. The father of the baby is revealed to be um, Cecil Mallon. He turns out to be a womanizing predator hypocrite. The novel debuts to rave reviews in, 19, in early 1902, and days later, an actual hypocritical womanizing predator socialist orator that Zoe knows named Courtney Lemon surfaces and says, I'm obviously the role model for this horrible character. I never did these terrible things. You know, she's Cecil Mallon barely describes my, barely conceals my real name. He threatens lawsuits and Funk and Wagnalls, a quite conservative publisher, pulls the book from the market. Threat to pretty girl novelist was one of the headlines during the legal wranglings. She's 42 and a grandmother when she gets called a pretty girl, but I suspect it bothered her less than you might think. By 1902, she shaved years off her age, five years, seven years. She eventually shaves a full 10 years off of her age, um, even on the census. Her birth year grows with every passing year. Um, you may be able to just make out the initials JKB at the bottom of the title page and at the bottom of one of these potted plants. That stands for John Kennedy Bryans, who illustrated the cover and the title page of Zoe's first book. Uh, he soon becomes her second husband. He's 12 years younger than she is. I don't think he ever finds out how old she really is. He's a prolific artist of mostly comic silhouettes for periodicals, newspapers. He has them printed on postcards. He illustrates the cover of Zoe's second book, The Quest of Polly Locke, based on her own experiences traveling in Southern Europe and particularly focused on the throngs of disabled beggars there that she longed to help. Jack also illustrated a book for a black author and pastor named James Carruthers, who became a good friend of Zoe's and Jack's. Zoe and Jack have interesting friends, but the marriage nonetheless seems to sour quickly. Zoe begins to write in her fiction and journalism about how boring it is to be married to a humorist and to sit around all day and watch someone grind out fun. Um, a number of her uh, of fictional women writers um, are married to men who drain them emotionally and financially. I don't think they ever formally divorce. In one of her stories, um, a, a successful woman writer runs into her estranged ne'er-do-well husband on the streets and he asks for, if she wants to formalize the divorce yet. And she says, no, I don't want to be vulnerable to marrying again, looks him dead in the eye and says, I have bad taste in men. Um, also by 1903, 1904, um, Clarence, Zoe's daughter and grandson, Robert Morris, managed to get out of London. They get to New York. Jack refuses to live with his stepfamily, and uh, Zoe kicks him out and welcomes back her family. 1905, 1906, she supports the family with a fire hose, particularly of newspaper journalism. She walks the perimeter of Manhattan for the New York Times, and she writes down memorable haunting details like a pushcart lying on its back with its empty arms imploring the heavens. She sees little kids with um, sacks of kindling on their backs. They've been sent out to the waterfront to collect bits of wood that can be used to burn in the stoves in their tenement apartments in the winter. 
The New York Sun hires her to interview all the most prominent zoo animals in town. She brings her business card. She makes formal appointments. And the tortoise complains, all anybody wants to ask me is how old I am. And I hate that question. And my wife particularly hates that question. And the hippo complains, every time I open my mouth even, I make a sensation and I get all this unwanted attention. And Zoe reassures the hippo, you should just be glad you're not a woman journalist, because then when you open your mouth, you really get in trouble. For the New York Sun, she writes 12 stories that she collects into the form of her third book, 12 Kentucky Colonel Stories. They're based on feuds that broke out in and around her little old dog kennel of a hometown. Some of them are based on real feuds that I can find documented in um, newspapers, archives. Men used to get away with murdering each other in broad daylight because it was an affair of honor, or Anna, H-O-N-N-A-H, as the characters, uh, as, as Zoe spelled out the heavy Kentucky accent for these characters. But some of these stories, they're based, obviously, based on an imaginary feud. In one case, a terrible, bitter feud breaks out. One man's mother-in-law has been shot by accident during a gunfight. Um, she's wounded in the arm. And two clans then try to exterminate each other because of this incident. And at the end of the story, you realize, of course, the reason the feud is so bitter is that that man hated his mother-in-law and wanted her killed outright instead of simply wounded. Um, now, by 1907, 1908, her newspaper journalism is particularly focused on immigrant neighborhoods, a little bit in East Harlem, but mostly on the Lower East Side. And her heart breaks to see the little mothers, the little fathers of these neighborhoods. Those are the four, five, and six-year-olds who are assigned, and it's just accepted, that they will be home with their infant siblings while their parents are out working in sweatshops. Zoe sees little kids pushing baby carriages who can't see over the handlebars. And yet she comes to admire the resourcefulness of the poor, that they can turn a, a doorway, a stairwell, into a thriving pickle stand, for example. By 1908, well, that's to Zoe's daughter Clarence at lower left and the boy on the far right of that row, that's Zoe's grandson, Robert. By 1908, Clarence remarries. She marries a farmer and seed company owner in Kentucky and she brings her, her son, they, they leave Zoe behind. Zoe had loved living with them. She called them Madonna con Bambino. The Bam was the little boy's nickname. And when they leave her, she's bereft. At some point, she ends up in a charity hospital. She's delirious. She's convinced the staff would kill her, except they realize she's a well-known writer. In 1909, she pulls herself together. She decides to found as an experiment her own magazine, a bi-monthly called The East Side. By then, she's tired of being told what to do by male editors. By then, and she writes about all of this, she's the male editors have stiffed her on fees, plagiarized her sexually harassed her, accused her of various misdeeds. She decides to experiment by running her own show. She has some diamond jewelry left, some earrings, and she pawns them. The East Side. By then, she's living on East 15th Street between 1st and 2nd. She is on the seventh floor of a newish building. She faces south. She overlooks a sea of desperate immigrant poverty that stretches basically all the way to City Hall. And she writes about everything she sees. She writes about the telephone line man shimmying up the pole, risking his life, handing out wires to upwardly mobile immigrants. She sees little kids barefoot dangling from the fire escapes, trying to help their parents with chores, help their parents wash the windows. Um, that's her brochure on the left. When she sends out a press release with her early issues, she writes basically, I've got enough material just looking out my window to last me the rest of my writing days. And on her brochure, she runs an image of herself looking out her window at the material that she is mining. She gets blurbs from early supporters, including Elbert Hubbard, the great tastemaker philosopher who runs an arts and crafts utopian community in Western New York, and also uh, David Starr Jordan, the first president of Stanford. She writes virtually every word in her own bi-monthly magazine, all 29 issues from early 1909 to uh, days before her death in 1914. And she gives herself all the masthead titles and she changes them with every issue. And over the years, they include, for example, Printer's Devil, Circulation Liar, Office Boy, High Muckamuck, The Whole Cheese, and The Whole Shebang. 
she finds an illustrator named William Oberhart who's willing to work for her for free. He's an up and comer. She can't afford to pay him. All she can do is share with him the press passes she's getting. She gets free tickets to movies and uh, to um, theater and musicals. And she shares the, the free tickets. She's reviewing them in her magazine and she gives him a share of the tickets. And he follows her around the, her around the slums and whatever she's writing about, he's illustrating. So she's writing about gaunt, exhausted child laborers and the bewildered newest arrivals at Ellis Island and the, the peddler stands. She writes about a rabbi. He gives her a portrait of a rabbi to put on the cover. Um, she writes about the skyscrapers wiping away the peddler stands. That's a ramp for the Manhattan Bridge. That's the municipal building. That's the Woolworth building. So this was done on East Broadway, just a few blocks from the museum at Eldridge Street. Um, she writes about going to synagogue services and he supplies this image. That's the interior of the synagogue at 60 Rivington Street. It's the only one it can be. It had two tiers of women's galleries. I'm desperate to get into it. Anybody who knows what I'm talking about, it's owned by an artist um, and he won't let me in. Anybody who knows him, please, please, please tell him I'm harmless. I just wanna bring the issue that was illustrated inside his synagogue back into that interior. I don't know how William Oberhart got into the women's galleries during services. It's possible he dressed in drag. It's possible that Zoe, who had some art training, did the initial sketch and then he turned it into that dramatic black and red cover. In the course of the 29 issues, she gets angrier and angrier at how the poor are mistreated by corrupt and competent politicians, corrupt and competent charities, violent policemen. She writes about everything she sees. She begs for basic government reforms. Can we get the trash cans emptied on the Lower East Side the way we can in wealthier neighborhoods a few blocks away so they don't spread deadly disease here? Can we impose sensible alimony laws so that a man can't simply move to New Jersey and then not have to be liable for paying any alimony child support to his family left starving and freezing back in New York? She sees men, women, children tottering under enormous burdens, being handed cups full of water as if they were animals. She sees men trudging through toxic muck in factories and basically saying, at least I'm well paid and I know I'm going to die young. She goes to visit the homes of the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, who were also immortalized as is so in one of Adrian Ottenberg's gorgeous banners at the museum at Eldridge Street. She goes from tenement to tenement and she specifically documents how charities that had promised to help them had reneged on their promises and how they are crushed with grief. In some cases, when she knocks at the doors of these families, they've gone back to Europe. They've gone back to Eastern Europe or Italy. They'd rather face violence and starvation there than stay in a promised land where their teenage daughter had been killed in a fire, a 16 minute fire caused by factory owners greed. She sees um, peddlers getting in spats for control of particularly prosperous corners on the curb. She writes about herself, her beauty treatments, her bad marriages, her life in Kentucky, Kansas, she wants to viscerally experience what it's like to be poor. She wraps herself in shawls and bandanas. At times she pretends to be homeless and she goes to charities asking for help finding shelter. And at times she borrows an accordion. She attaches a cup to it for coins and she goes out on the streets and begs. She makes a dollar fifty in one day of accordion playing on the streets, which is more she writes than she would have had she stayed home and just been a magazine publisher. One of the few songs she can play on the accordion is My Old Kentucky Home. She does not make a terribly persuasive immigrant musician, and she makes fun of herself in her own magazine for being a bad undercover reporter. Um, at lower left, that's a portrait of Zoe that appeared in a nationally syndicated profile, newspaper profile of her. She becomes uh, known nationwide as one of the few women to live in the slums by choice and document the experience. You may be able to just make out over her typewriter, there was a sign, this is my busy day, it said. She often wrote about the physical act of typing. One of her best poems is called um, The Song of the Typewriter, and the refrain is, now work, damn you work. And so she wrote about writing and all the physical aspects of getting a magazine together. And then she wrote about being written about for writing about these things. And then I'm writing about a woman who wrote about being written about for writing about writing and the meta layers, they just keep piling up and I keep finding more information about her. 
She's one of literally hundreds of dreamers in her time who found their own small, literally about four by six inch magazine. There's hundreds of them. They're all underfinanced, understaffed, and told from the viewpoint of one strongly opinionated owner or editor. Zoe is one of the few women to try this unprofitable trade. One of her few female counterparts is Emma Goldman, also immortalized in one of Adrian Ottenberg's gorgeous banners. Um, but Emma Goldman's Mother Earth magazine, headquartered just a few blocks from Zoe's home. Emma Goldman was on East 13th Street. Zoe was on East 15th Street. Um, Emma Goldman takes contributions from multiple authors, and Zoe writes virtually every word herself. Um, the people running these magazines, they get in spats with each other. They're like modern day bloggers. One would insult someone in, 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 one, in, a, in a Jan Feb issue and then get insulted back in a, in a, in a May, June issue. Um, they all charge about the same, 10 cents per issue, a dollar a year for a subscription. $10 got you a lifetime subscription. Zoe would run your name if you gave her $10 alongside her mastheads and call you a life preserver. Um, the guy who ran the Open Road magazine at Lower Left, his name was Bruce Calvert. He was a back to nature advocate. He excoriated Zoe for loving to live in cities. He considered them dangerous, unhealthful, underworlds of darkness. And Zoe wrote back to him, Bruce, you can have the countryside. I grew up out there. All, I, all I'd ever want from the countryside, I've got it better in New York. I've got the streams of humanity carving rivers between the boulders of skyscrapers, veined in gold with windows flashing back the fire of the sun. And the cedars of Central Park are better than anything I'd find on any mountaintop because they're kept company by the perimeter of apartment lights around the park. Bruce Calvert, you can have the countryside. I grew up out there. All it ever gave me was poison ivy. Even as she pleads for basic government reforms, she doesn't want to be pigeonholed as a shrill reformer. She wants to draw more people into her cause um, and attract more subscribers by having some fun once in a while. Every Wednesday or Thursday, she throws a blowout dinner party um, at a different New York restaurant for her intentionally disorganized organization called the Ragged Edge Club with a K dedicated to the killing of care, with a K, with comfortable, with a K, exclusiveness, with a K, the killing of care. No rules, no dues, no membership directories, no constitutions, no amendments, no motions, no motions to adjourn, just the killing of care. She writes about the Ragged Edgers in her magazine and they're fascinating. They're physicians, lawyers, reformers, performers, artists, businessmen, just curious about the Lower East Side. She um, gives a little bit of biographical detail about them and in her magazine. And when I've dug deeper, often I have found out, oh, that's not their real name. They've changed their name. They're on the run from a scandal back in their conservative hometown. They are immigrants who've reinvented themselves in New York, just like Zoe and the people she's writing about. She has a friend who calls herself Catherine Stuyvesant Van Ness Roberts, and her real name is Mabel Tinley, and she's a con artist. There's no paperwork for the Ragged Edge Club except for what you're seeing at top right, an invitation. Kindly put the humble hostess wise, she said on these little cards. There was no formal RSVP required. The Ragged Edgers dance. They dance like dervishes. They dance between meal courses. They don't wait till, the, till after dinner to get started, to roll up the rugs. Some of the music they dance to is provided by a black uh, ragtime pianist and composer named Harry Huggs. And I found some of his gorgeously il uh, illustrated Art Nouveau sheet music at lower right um, in the copyright files at the, labor of, at the Library of Congress. This is a fraction of my collection of other sheet music composed, performed by Zoe's friends in the Ragged Edge Club. You can see a recurring image of a woman with great hair, great hats, um, of this, these cameo photographs, that's Libby Blondell. She was a vaudeville singer, friend of Zoe's. Blondell, that's not her real last name. Blue Stein was her first husband's real last name. Sometimes Libby Blondell put an E at the end of her name in, in her signatures and in print, and sometimes she didn't, because it didn't matter, it was a fake name anyway. Um, at the bottom, you can see there's some golden grain choreography that was published by Zoe's friend, Louis Chalif. He was the dance master of the Ragged Edge Club. He ran a dance school uh, near Carnegie Hall called the Temple to Terpsichore because the Ragged Edgers had to learn all the latest moves, including the airship quadrille, the tarpon squirm, and the banana peel slide. The banana peel slide required a yellow gown with a high slit up the hip and white tights underneath that showed as you danced the banana peel slide. 
This is a fraction of my collection of postcards depicting the Ragged Edger's favorite restaurants. Mostly on the Lower East Side, there's images of Cafe Boulevard on Lower Second Avenue, Little Hungary um, on, um, on East Houston. These are images of the interior of Cafe Boulevard. In the center, oh, they went out to the, the summer resorts. They went out to Brighton Beach and Coney Island in the summer. In the center is a postcard from um, Jules Bohemia. That was a restaurant near Times Square. I bought that on eBay and not until I got it, it arrived and I examined it closely under a magnifying glass did I realize, oh my God, one of the portraits on the wall, when you blow it up, as you see top, as you see on the left to the maximum pixelation, it's Zoe Norris. That with a dramatic black feather in her in on her hat. That's the kind of fixture she was of New York nightlife. That her her picture was on a dining room wall, and then it was it, it appeared that small on a postcard souvenir from the restaurant Joel's Bohemia. This is a fraction of my collection of cutlery and glassware from the Ragged Edger's favorite restaurants because there's nothing I often say that brings you closer to the feeling that you're in the presence of the spirit of someone you've been writing about, reading, uh, lecturing on for years now than to hold a pickle fork in your hand from a restaurant you know they dined at. I've got a wine siphon in this picture from uh, Little Hungary. I've got cheap knickknack souvenirs from Little Hungary. I've got a, a silver creamer from Cafe Boulevard. I've snuck in a bottle of bourbon whiskey made by one of Zoe's relatives back in her Kentucky hometown. The only restaurant where the Ragged Edgers dined that survives under its original name is Keen's, the steakhouse near Herald Square. I've got a white bowl from there. Um, at, I know the Ragged Edgers, for instance, had Thanksgiving at Keene's in 1913, and anyone was invited who had no home ties, whether because they were poor and they had no place else to go, or because they didn't like their real families and they had no home ties because they wanted to spend Thanksgiving with people they actually liked. She becomes known nationwide as the Queen of Bohemia. And at first she hates that title because Bohemia in her time suggested a place where people were willing to live in filth and indulge all their worst impulses. So a man in Bohemia felt perfectly justified in running off with his latest affinity as lovers were euphemistically called and leaving his family starving and freezing. But she gets called it so often she just decides to claim it. And she writes in her magazine, if I'm going to be the queen, I need a peerage, I need aristocrats. And she takes a long necked Hungarian wine bottle and uses it as a scepter to ennoble her friends. And thus is anointed, for example, Lady Betty Rogers of the Bronx, Countess Ella Bosworth of Brooklyn, and Baron Bernhardt of Hoboken, her tipsy peerage that spilled out onto the streets of the Lower East Side at dawn. Um, also in the 1910s, she publishes one more book, The Way of the Wind. It's a novel based on her own family's disastrous experience descending into poverty and madness at the Kansas frontier. It's beautifully written. It's incredibly sad. She publishes it herself. She tries to market it herself and very few copies sell. In the last issue, Jan Feb 1914 of the East Side, she writes about her recent vivid dream that she's going to die soon. She writes that my little mother came to me in a dream. Her mother, Henrietta, had died in an insane asylum in 1897 back in Kentucky. My little mother warned me, you're the next of my many children to die. Zoe writes that she shrieked at this dream warning and then grew relieved. If this dream comes true, she writes in her last issue, I'm glad I'm being given some time to prepare. I hope I've done some good for the world by fighting for the poor with my pen, and I want all the ragged edgers to throng my funeral. She mails out the issue. She goes to a ragged edge dinner. She collapses. She's brought to a hospital across Second Avenue from the restaurant, and she dies. And the ragged edgers do, in fact, throng her funeral. And these are some of the condolence cards, uh, calling cards that they left. So um, a middle of the left-hand column, you can see there's a... Um, a business card, a calling card from Libby Arnold Blondell uh, with an E at the end, that's Zoe's vaudeville star friend. Um, near the bottom of the right column, you can see there's a handwritten brown card, Sympathy of Mrs. E. M. Bosworth, that was Countess Ella Bosworth of Brooklyn. Um, the center image is from the family of William Oberhart, Zoe's illustrator. And at the top with the black rectangle on it, that was a card sent out by Zoe's friend, Jack McPike, the Prince of McPike, as he was known. He was a cigar dealer from Missouri. He sent out that card trying to keep the Ragged Edge Club going after Zoe's death, and it lasted about a year or so. The news that the Queen of Bohemia had accurately predicted her own death made headlines in hundreds of newspapers nationwide, and some of the obituaries were illustrated with an image of what the dream might have looked like. 
She wanted to be buried in New York, but her family had her body sent home to the family plot in Harrodsburg. The cemetery is on a sleepy side street. I have no idea who's come there over the years and wondered why in heaven's name is the epitaph on this one stone say it was erected by the Ragged Edge Club of New York. Also, the headstone has her exact death date, but there's no information about her birth year, nothing. Um, I believe that her friends were trying to help her protect the secret, even in the afterlife, of how old she really was. So her legacy, barreling towards the end here, and then there's going to be a little architectural epilogue of buildings where Zoe lived, worked, and partied. Her legacy. On the left, that's her grandson, Robert Morris, the Bam, the Bambino, as she called him. He joined the Navy. He became an admiral. He was part of the armada that landed uh, allied forces on the Mediterranean coast during World War II and helped free Southern Europe from Nazi control. Zoe's daughter Clarence and her second husband Fletcher Chelf, who's a seed company owner and a farmer, they have a daughter named Mary, born a few years after Zoe's death. Mary becomes a prominent singer. She's a globe-trotting mezzo-soprano. She eventually retires to Harrodsburg, and on the main drag, she founds a theater in memory of the grandmother she never knew, the Ragged Edge Community Theater, which it thrives to, where it thrives to this day. I'm going to go visit it in June. Also, Mary drafted a book about Zoe, but never published it, and it's been incredibly useful for my research. Zoe had no will. She had no possessions of value, but she did bequeath us all, of course, a great story. I own more of her work in print, I suspect, than she did. Um, it, is, it appears in an enormous range of magazines, and I keep finding more stories, and I keep rereading the stories I already found and realizing, oh, there's more autobi autobiography buried there. She definitely wants to be written about as a uh, by a woman writer for writing about being written about for writing. So last slide, and then we're going to go to the little architectural epilogue. So I tracked down her illustrator, William Oberhart's descendants in rural Maryland. They had a, an attic stacked to the ceiling with his papers. We're talking hundreds of drawings, correspondence, photographs. He went on to enormous fame as an illustrator, for instance, providing the sketches for the first cover of Time magazine in the 1920s. The family had this enormous archive. They were persuaded, bless them, to donate everything to New York Historical Society. So it's nice and safe in institutional hands. New York Historical, however, sensibly, didn't take the lithograph stones. There were two or three left in family hands, and they're beastly heavy. Um, but I had to have the stone that has Zoe's portrait on lower left uh, uh, on it. Um, that's a portrait of her that appeared in one of the last issues of the East Side. I had to have that stone. So the family put it in three tote bags for me, and it tore through all three tote bags on the Amtrak ride home, but I had to get it back to New York, where Zoe felt most at home. And finally, on the right, that's me in front of her building, 338 East 15th Street, her literary sanctum, as she called it. I'm holding up a cheap reprint of the East Side. The left-hand page is the song of the typewriter, the poem with the refrain, now work, damn you work. And the right-hand page is Zoe dressed as an immigrant, wrapped in shawls, playing the accordion on the streets and begging and playing, of all things, my old Kentucky home. So that photo of me in front of her building was taken five, six years ago. And I went back six, eight months late or something like that. And I realized, oh wait, the last time I was here, there was graffiti on the door that said lost. And now the graffiti has gone because she's not lost anymore. She's found. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment while I go to our little architectural epilogue. Hang on one second. I'm going to okay so while you pull those up eve i'd encourage everyone to think of any questions that you might have for after uh, we see these few photographs please feel free to put them in the chat and i can read them for you um at our conclusion um or you could wait and raise your hand at the very end okay so i'm going to burn through a bunch of images of places where zoe lived and worked and partied over the years uh this is near the flatiron building she lived in a couple of different apartment houses near there in those sort of dark canyons right off broadway um I, and uh this is another one of them i weasel my way into these buildings by pretending to be renting an apartment for my daughter um and she does live in new york and she does rent an apartment this is just not a neighborhood she would ever live in um and i know that zoe would approve of any kind of undercover reporting like that subterfuge um i weaseled my way in and this is one of the staircases that zoe would have trod tr trudged up after a particularly depressing meeting with a male editor and um 
Once when I uh, came to that building, there was a psychic on the second floor and I was tempted to go in and ask if the spirit of the queen of Bohemia, if there was any trace of her there, but I lost my nerve. And then I went back a few months later and the, and the psychic was gone. So I'll never know whether there was any trace of the spirit of the queen of Bohemia there. Um, her building was right across from, um, uh, and, and the, the building survives. Oh, the original Stuyvesant High School was right across, just north of her. And uh, the view that she had of, of the court of a hundred living windows, as she called her view, it's largely blocked now by modern buildings on the north side of um, 14th Street. Oops, um, that's, this is just a, this is just a tax photo from the 1940s of her building. Um, the Greek key tile mosaic floors survives in the foyer, and so does an original staircase that Zoe would have trudged up. The elevator oper operator stopped working late at nights, so she had to walk up seven flights to her apartment after ragged edge dinners. That's a snippet of a view she had of the Court of a Hundred Living Windows. She also had glimpses on the horizon of skyscrapers that she describes. She describes the gorgeous lilac sunsets that she could see. Um, once when I came there, um, come the fuck in or fuck the fuck off was written on the welcome mat. I weaseled my way in, once again, pretending to be renting apartments for my daughter. I think Zoe would love that welcome mat. This is one of the charities she tried to help. This is um, on Lower Second Avenue. This was the Little Mother's Aid Society. It was an ch entire charity dedicated to trying to help the uh, five, six, four, five, and six-year-olds who were home alone with their infant siblings while their parents were working at sweatshops. This is the synagogue at 60 Rivington Street. I know that that's the, that's the one that has the two tiers of women's galleries. And I, that, that's the one that appeared on a cover of her magazine. That's the one I'm desperate to get into. You can see me looking forlorn in, in, by the front door. I know she went to services at this synagogue on East 7th Street. It's now been cut up into um, apartments. I know this is on Rivington Street, and I know she was here. Uh, this was a shelter for homeless women. And I know that she went to this place just to see how they treated homeless women. Not well, as it turned out. Uh, these are two buildings, 95 and 96 uh, Rivington Street, where I know she um, witnessed the good that the university settlement was doing there. Uh, this is 243 Broadway. It's up to Bowery. It's right north of the new museum. It was run by the Salvation Army as a home for, uh, as, a, as a shelter for homeless women. And again, I know they were not well treated when in Zoe's time there. I know she went to the Education Alliance on East Broadway. She went to a classroom. There were a thousand traumatized children there the day she was there. And she asked them to tell her of their grievances and no one dared speak. It is others who grieve for them was how she wrote up this experience in her magazine. Um, this is a restaurant on Mott Street where I know she dined. And this is a restaurant on Pell Street where I know she dined. She wandered around Chinatown trying to figure out if uh, Chinese wives imitated their white counterparts yet and would be seen having little dinner parties out at restaurants. And she was firmly told that no, these women were not assimilated yet enough to do that, that they were all at home. There any, anyone, any respectable Chinese wife would only be seen dining at home with her husband. And this is a building on Henry Street, where I know she interviewed the, one of the families of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire victims. Um, I chalk on the sidewalks in front of these buildings with the, in the, during the annual chalking ceremonies on the anniversary of the fire, March 25th. Um, this is a building on Pike Street that's in the vicinity of where Zoe interviewed one of the families. Um, this, that was where Anna Altman had lived. Louis Altman wrote Zoe a letter say, basically saying, I understand you're interviewing the, the victim's families. I can't be interviewed. My English isn't good enough. And then he goes on to describe how broken they are with grief and poverty. And this is on Madison Street where uh, Becky Koppelman had lived, one of the victims. Becky's sister Gussie was a coworker and survived the fire and was expected to keep working um, despite all the trauma and grief that, that she was paralyzed by. And I just chalked the other day in front of Becky's building on, Ma on, on Madison Street. And uh, this is a building, this is a restaurant on Lower Second Avenue. This in Zoe's day was called Cotachoni and Kometz, the least mellifluously named restaurant in the history of New York. This was a restaurant on Lower Second Avenue called Pokol, which means hell in Hungarian. 
Um, and I snuck in to take a photograph of the tin ceiling that had echoed with the sound of the ragged edgers uh, dancing to Harry Huggs' ragtime piano tunes. This is a restaurant, uh, this was a restaurant in Zoe's time on Lower Second Avenue that owned by her friend Alexander Bolog. And she teased him that he had wine spigots attached to um, all the walls and the ceiling and even the floor so that wine poured out of everywhere when people came in. Uh, this is uh, 156 Second Avenue. This is where um, Cafe Boulevard was. And it's also where the Second Avenue Deli was. And now it's uh, Chase Bank occupies that space. This is 203 Second Avenue where uh, Zoe, the, the People's Hospital, the charity hospital where Zoe died it was. It's owned by Ukrainian groups now. Um, and they're very proud that it was the People's Hospital, a, a beloved neighborhood institution. And they've left the tile floor with the People's Hospital name on it. This is 101 Avenue A, where Zoe's funeral took place. It was a German-American community hall. In the 1980s, it became the Pyramid Club and how Zoe would have loved to know that there was that crazy out of control uh, drag and punk nightclub scene in the building where her funeral was held. It's owned by the Knitting Factory now. And I snuck in when it was under renovations a year or so ago. And uh, those are the ceiling joists that would have echoed with the sound of the Ragged Edgers mourning Zoe. She could see Stuyvesant Park from the roof of her building just to the Northwest. She called the trees there the kindly people. And she complained that there weren't enough flower beds there. And then she saw the government actually possibly reading her magazine and putting in beautiful flower beds. Um, the glamorous woman in this photo, her name is Catherine Segerson. She runs a literary magazine in California. She's a direct descendant of one of Zoe's sisters. So there's literary, mag there's, there's magazine helming, um, genetically being, being genetically passed down in the family. And uh, that's Catherine coming to see her great, great aunt at, in the Adrian Ottenberg's gorgeous banner at the museum at Eldridge Street, and illuminated by stained glass, um, stars of David shining through. And that's me admiring Adrian's beautiful banner and the, the banner that I have um, brought home and, and, uh, and love the fact that I've got Adrian and Zoe right behind me tonight. So thank you all for listening. I'm going to stop sharing and thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Eve. That was so such an amazing opportunity. We have a few questions in the chat and then I have a few questions as well, if you don't mind. Um, but we questions. have one question about how you started becoming interested in Zoe and wanting to write a biography about her. So I'm a member of the Groyer Club, a museum slash club slash library on um, 60th Street, open to the public for free six days a week, 11 months a year. This is not a plug. No, it is a plug. Um, I'm a member there and there was a, another member was preparing to exhibit there a fraction of his collection of American magazines. Steve Lamezo, bless you, he owns 83,000 American periodicals at last count. We went to visit his home in New Jersey for a preview of the show, and he brought out this quirky bound magazine, The East Side, six issues, a year's worth, bound in a volume. And I started leafing through it. And I thought, who's this woman, Zoe Anderson Norris? She's got her name written huge um, on, the, on the cover and inside the magazine. I've never heard of her. And she is sympathetically portraying my mother's Ukrainian-born parents and aunts and uncles. Um, at a time of virulent anti-Semitism in the 1910s. And I thought, why don't I know about her? And wait, wait, there's no, there isn't even a basic Wikipedia entry on her. And that's fall of 2018. Wow. So and now, now there moment. is, I hope. Did you write the Wikipedia page now? I did, yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> I yeah. used to enjoy personally when I was a student going to Wikipedia writing parties. So it's very important to have, have appropriate pages on everyone who's important. Yeah. Um, we have another question in the chat. Um, beyond her descendant that started writing a book on Zoe and found the theater in her name, how familiar were her siblings with her life and her accomplishments? How did the descendants react to all of your amazing research? And I'd like to add, can you tell us more afterwards about her descendants that you've spoken to? Oh, okay. So 12, 12 siblings that survived to adulthood. Um, there were one, maybe only three or four were still in touch, were still alive and still in touch with her by the time she became the queen of Bohemia. She was bitterly estranged from one of them. One of them, she'd gone to visit her back in their little old dog kennel of a hometown and that sibling was wealthy and treated her coldly. 
um, as this ne'er do well from the big city, and she cut off contact with that with that sibling, that sister, I believe. A couple of the others she stayed in touch with. Um, they're all fascinating people in in different ways, but she wasn't particularly close to any of them. And also, you have to understand it was a, it you know how many days it would have taken for her to visit her relatives um, back in back mostly in her relatives ended up mostly in Kentucky and Kansas. Um, descendants, descendants. There's so many cool descendants. Uh, so. Zoe's daughter, Clarence, as you saw, had, had a son named Robert. Robert's daughters, uh, two, of da Robert's three, two of Robert's three daughters are alive, and there's a whole bunch of grandchildren, and they're fascinating. And I hope some of them are listening to this because they're in the arts. One of them is an actor, Chris Stack. Go see him in Stereophonic on Broadway. Uh, this is a plug. It, they are an amazing family. A ton of them are, are involved in the arts and a ton of them are involved in theater as well. They're great storytellers. It gets passed down. That's amazing that there are so many still that you can find. Um, and I'm curious, there's so much lore about her, including from her family. Have there been any like have there been any wild stories you've either had to refute or confirm from your research? Oh, so the family's been incredibly generous with what papers they have. A lot of stories weren't passed down, but you know, they heard the, the basic outlines of Zoe being the queen of Bohemia who fought for the poor with her pen. But um, I've been digging up stuff. I mean, I mean, crazy stuff is digitized. Sorry, I'm not, there, is, there are archivists, historians on this call, really serious people. Um, who know what I'm talking about. I mean, the National Archives, the 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 the, the NARA files, there's um in incredibly sad documentation of how one of Zoe's sisters died while being married to a government official who was also a Civil War veteran. There's miles of documentation about that sister who died in childbirth, and another sister proceeded to marry the widower. And then their relationship deteriorated and he died young, but he'd gotten custody of the kids by the as their relationship fell apart. I mean, this was never meant to be seen. And yet there it all is. And it's haunting and powerful. And it's in my book that the sister who ended up the sister, the, the sister who became the second husband of that widower, the second wife of that widower, ended up um, becoming a government clerk herself. And pleading for help finding a, a, a finding paid positions with American presidents. And you write an American president a letter and somebody puts it in a file and then it gets digitized someday. So I could tell you exactly what she was going through, desperate for work. And then I could tell you how Zoe wrote about her being desperate for work. I mean, I think the most interesting history probably was not meant to be seen. So I think that's definitely um, a trend um, that we, at least, especially at the, at the museum, find, you know, the family history, oral history, and that ends up being the most interesting. Um, I'm going to allow folks to unmute themselves. So if anyone would like to raise their hand, feel free. But in the meantime, while folks are gathering their thoughts, um, I was wondering if there's been anything new and exciting, even your research that you've been finding. I know that you've been back and forth from a lot of libraries, a lot of archives. Um, you got time for a minute, minute long story, Maya? You're okay with it? We have, we have three minutes. We have three minutes, okay. So um, in her own magazine, she wrote about how by around 1906, she got fired from newspaper writing. She got accused of being an anti-Semite. And she was livid at this because she had written miles of sympathetic material about Jews. So I was never able to figure out. She wrote that she had published something that enraged someone in power. And that's why she'd gotten fired. And I could never figure out exactly what she had done. And, and um, you know, I, I, I and, and I'm certainly never going to get his side of the story. Um, a, a story that she wrote about the, that experience, a little memoir essay turned up literally about two-ish weeks ago on eBay, on a magazine I'd been trying to find that no library in America has. New York Public had the only copy and, they, and, it, and it got misshelved at some point. On eBay, I found the story in which she explains what happened, which is this. She went out to Ellis Island in September one year and it was hot and crowded and the room that these that there was a whole group of recent arrivals from Eastern Europe Jews were shoved into this hot, crowded, smelly room. And they were all the people who were about to be deported. 
there was something wrong with them, according to the immigration officials. One of them was 60. He was a rabbi. He was considered LPC, which stands for likely public charge, meaning he was going to he was being sent back you know, application denied, appeal denied. There was a guy in his 40s, and it's not clear what problem he had that was getting him sent back. And he had, he was leaving behind a wife. He was, his wife and children had made it through, but he hadn't. There was a teenage boy weeping in the doorway. And despite all this trauma they had just experienced and all the trauma they were about to go back and experience, the government gave them a couple of days uh, reprieve so that they could celebrate the, the Jewish New Year, so that they could blow the shofar and sing and dance and pray and in their prayer shawls. And Zoe wrote about this haunting thing. And she also wrote that she envied Jews their unshakable faith in God, that, that in spite of all these horrible obstacles, these horrible experiences, they wanted to, they wanted to celebrate Rosh Hashanah. That was the story she wrote. And she got accused of anti-Semitism because she described the conditions as dirty. And she, she was accused that she had called the immigrants that, which is not what she said at all. So I found how she defended herself. And then I went back into the New York Sun and it was an unsigned piece, but I found the piece in which she wrote about this. She interviewed a guy named Alexander Harkavy, who was a Yiddish scholar in addition to being an, um, he worked for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society out at Ellis Island. So I just pieced together what she actually did and what she got accused of doing that she hadn't done. and. Um, in this story, Defending Herself from 1907, she wrote, if I'd been a man, the newspaper editors would have stood by me, and this would never have happened to me. If I'd been a man, I would have still been on staff or still been a, you know, a steady stringer. Wow, that's, a, that's an amazing story. And I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many people actually went to Ellis Island to see what was going on, but I know that we we hear all about it, but we usually hear about it from the perspective of of the immigrants themselves who were either making it or not making it, but hearing about it from a kind of a, a second party um, is really fascinating and, and unique, especially a woman who, you know, is sympathetic to the conditions. Um, that's really incredible. And I, I know that we, especially at the museum, we, the sun is a really huge resource for us about how other people viewed the the synagogue, the congregants, um, traditions that they know nothing about. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's so interesting. She was accused of anti-Semitism for that when other people were the ones who were being anti-Semitic, not her. Yeah. And um, yeah, so just to be clear, she, she called, she compared Yiddish to hieroglyphics, <laughs> which we forgive her for, but her illustrator, William Oberhart, when he, she ran a, a Yiddish prayer, she ran a prayer that she'd had somebody fact check for her, translate and fact check for her on, in, in her own magazine. She ran a blessing on the back cover in Yiddish in, in one of her magazines. And, um, her illustrator, William Oberhart, learned to copy the, the signs on stores and on the street. It's, it's, I've shown it to Yiddish scholars who say that he got it right. It really does say kosher. It really does say fish market, you know, this kind of thing. She got the signs right, and she ran those illustrations in her magazine. And she also, she went out there and sympathized with every imaginable ethnicity that was pouring through those gates. She, and she, she wrote down the anti-Semitic things that the, that the staff there sometimes said, or the, anti, the, the xenophobic, the anti-immigrant things that the staff there sometimes said. She wrote about, listen to what this horrible matron just said about these two girls whose boyfriends were supposed to come take, come, come welcome them, and the boyfriends haven't shown up, so they're going to be deported. She wrote about a little old Irish lady, fragile and you know looked like a china doll whose son was supposed to come get her and he never came and she sat and and you know she she wrote about that woman and she wrote about the 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 priest on the island who was trying to help that woman too she went out there countless times that's incredible. And I, if anyone is interested in, in as, as Zoe said, hieroglyphic signs, we have a lot of the old Yiddish signs at the museum. Um, not, this isn't Yiddish, but I have had a lot of um, questions about this recently. If anyone remembers the garden cafeteria, um, that uh, very, very famous and, and uh, traditional restaurant that used to be on, on the Lower East Side, their sign, the restaurant is no longer, but our, the sign is on the way to our bathrooms. So please come check all those signs out. We have one question from Christopher. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, sure thing. Um, I just wanted to really quick uh, ask one uh, follow-up question. Uh, thank you so much, Eve, for the great presentation. This is so fascinating. 
Um, I just wondered, was there any formal connection ever between uh, Zoe and the progressive movement? So with like, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, when he was, you know, building his his way up in New York or later on with Al Smith and Francis Perkins, like, did she have any formal connection to any of the progressive movements within the government? So she mostly hated politicians. Uh, <laughs> she thought Woodrow Wilson was boring, but at least a Southern gentleman or so she described him. She thought Theodore Roosevelt was a boor uh, with no manners. She, she was appalled by him. Um, in general, no, she had a couple of politician friends who were reformers. Some of them turned out to be sc um, scoundrels, but um, yeah, some of them turned out to be you know absolute hypocrites, but there were a few political reformers that she was friends with. Um, and in some cases, she um, made them guests of honor at her uh, Reagan Edge parties. And there was a reformer named Sophie Irene Loeb, um, who is um, who became head of the Children's Welfare Board, and we know that Sophie was a was a was a Ragged Edge honoree, and also went on to you know to uh, extensive government service. But it, she would never have gone to a political meeting. She didn't even support women's suffrage at first. She came around to it eventually, but at first she basically said. Um, a simpering idiot in silk and velvet came down from from a you know, wealthier neighborhood to try and convert me just to the suffrage cause. We have urgent problems here. We have people starve. We have children starving and freezing um, on the Lower East Side. We don't have time to wait to get the vote to elect p politicians who might be sympathetic to the poor. That's I feel like you don't normally hear people's, you know, what what people who didn't you know care about suffrage were, were thinking and it's honestly very similar to today where people are saying you know is it does my vote matter so it is is it even worth it which is a not really interesting thing to think about historically mm -hmm. um i if there are no more questions we're going to say goodbye tonight but i did want to notice can i can i just tell one more i just i just want to emphasize because this is the such a beautifully preserved synagogue um how many times she describes uh jewish faith and observance and uh, synagogue worship in her magazine. And she writes hauntingly vividly about um, looking out her windows on the Jewish holidays. And there's just candles everywhere. Uh, she had, she'd grown, she'd grown up in an evangelical household. By the time she was an adult, she, she basically never belonged to a formal church again. She thought that, you know, she had no respect for any kind of formal religion. And but she did still believe in Jesus. She was still a devout Christian to the to the to her last days. But she envied Jews their unshakable faith in God. She wrote about it to the end of her days. And what I don't want to tell her is that my own ancestors that she probably saw in the synagogues had had a ham sandwich for lunch. And I'm sorry, but the, <laughs> their, the unshakable faith that she saw was getting a little shaky by the time my ancestors were in town. It is so um, interesting that she ended up on the Lower East Side when, you know, she wasn't part of the groups that that ended up, that mostly ended up there, that had a connection there. Um, but she she did anyway, and that was really the center for activism in, in New York City at the time. Um, I did notice in the photo you showed of the, um, of her gravestone that they spelled club with a C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's unfortunate. I, I, I won, I think that the, the, so the gravestone would have been cut in, Harrodsburg, right? And I think that the guy cutting the stone thought that was a typo, that he'd gotten a he'd gotten some typed up piece of paper from New York, and he thought it was a it was a mistake. I can imagine anyone visiting her grave over from New York would have been very disappointed when they made the trip and saw that. <laughs> Someone needs to correct it with a sharpie. I think that would be very her. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Eve. And can you tell us how we can get your book once it's finished? Oh, so just keep an eye out for Fordham, Fordham University Press. It's 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 out for peer review right now. But as I said, I keep making discoveries. So I'm yeah, it's it'll be out in a yearish or so. That's what I'm hoping. Amazing. Well, everyone, keep an eye out on evecon.com so that you can get her book when it's finished. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Eve, thank you so much for doing this. Um, and thank you, Adrian. Um, I know you're going to be listening to this later um, for this wonderful show that started these amazing programming that we are having here. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care.